you, Miss Jennifer. I am glad that Jesus loves me. Amen. That's what that song was. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. Uh, let's see. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I had planned on this morning bringing you a message uh, entitled, Things That Scare Me. Things That Scare Me. Um, but I had to do some inward some inward reflecting and find out why I wanted to preach that. And I got to tell you, I was, I, 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 because I had been thinking about certain things and certain situations and certain points in my message that I was um, mad at, uh, angry at, which I believe is righteous anger, but at the same time, I, I, I didn't, uh, I think it's something I need to pray about before I preach on. Um, this one, I didn't have to pray about it. I didn't know. <laughs> I knew, I knew, um, instead of going the direction, the same subject, just, I don't, I can kind of tell, can anybody tell today's kind of sort of a low energy day? It's like, it's, there's a gray cloud literally over the city. I went to go pick up Bill this morning for church, and the city was still asleep, and people were just, it was, it's kind of a mellow day. I, I, I envision most of the city is still in their PJs, you know? Um, but, uh, it's a low energy day and, uh, I, uh, the sermon I was, I intended for the last four or five days, uh, was one that I thought, okay, that's, de- that's one that I can definitely preach. I may even yell, <laughs> uh, and, and kind of get excited about it. And, um, but I, 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 through conversations yesterday and through uh, one specific conversation, just on a certain topic, I, uh, something sparked in me. So I went and grabbed a couple of my Bibles and uh, grabbed uh, some commentaries and grabbed a couple Sword of the Lords. And um, I began to search and to do research. And what I want to do this morning is I want to, I want to bring you a message. I, I hope to finish it today. I don't want to have to cram it. Um, it's almost like um, cramming a good meal just for the sake of not having to take anything home, and then you, 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 you don't enjoy it because you walk out so full going, oh, I don't feel so well. I don't want to do that at church. I, if, I, if it takes two weeks, it takes two weeks. Um, but a conversation yesterday is uh, between my father and I, and it was just very quick, but it was along the lines of chastisement. I've never really heard sermons on the topic of chastisement. I have heard it um, uh, brought up. I've heard it passed by, but I've never heard it really preached or, or taught for that matter. Uh, and I want to bring you a message this morning, the work of chastisement, the work of chastisement. What is the purpose of it? Um, and that word chastisement is, means correction. It's just, it's, it's correction. It's God's way of, of getting a hold of us. Uh, what I want to do is I want, I want to do something I don't normally do. Uh, I'm going to read several verses of Scripture. I'll usually just take three or four or just a portion, maybe just even one that may be a text verse. But I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12. And I just want you to follow along with uh, what I read, and then we'll pray and hop into the message. The Bible says in verse number 12 of Hebrews 1, or, uh, verse number 1 of Hebrews 12, Wherefore... Seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Here's the exhortation. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you, uh, uh, with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, 
Wherefore are all the partakers? Then are ye, nobody likes this word, but then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, or since then, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that by which lame, uh, excuse me, uh, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without uh, which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I could keep continue to read, but there's no, there's there's a lot to unpack there. There you go. There's a word for you back there. Uh, there's a lot. There's so much there. And uh, one, one, I'll share this very quickly. One way that has been a blessing to me the last couple of weeks has been taking a portion of scripture, whether it be 17 verses or seven verses or one verse and reading it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, I read, um, I began in, in Job chapter one uh, and chapter two, all of chapter one and chapter two verses one through 10. And it begins to give you the unfolding story of Job. And there's so much that began to reveal itself out of those scriptures. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, I'd rather soak my soul in several verses than rinse my hands in several chapters. I have to admit to you, growing up, I was a rinse my hands kind of guy. My mind was on other things. It was on basketball. It was on getting out of school. It was on anything and everything besides um, literature besides intellect, besides anything. I had no time for that. Um, but uh, now the older I've gotten, the, re- the more I realize, uh, I, the, m- the more I need those things. Um, and it makes me happy to see my, my sons reading books and to devouring things up uh, because I know they get that from um, their mother. Uh, they don't get it from their dad. Uh, but um, uh, this thing of, about chastisement, I've always wondered about it. I've always, you know, I, I've heard preachers say that if God doesn't chasten you, then you're not his son. And I'm always like, all right, well, I hate chastening, but I'd like to, be, Lord, if you're chastening me, I'd really like to know it. <laughs> I want to know uh, that uh, I'm, I'm your, your, your son. I, I need to know that. And I want to know when I'm being chastened. Now, a lot of Christians, we misunderstand um, the purpose we misunderstand the process of godly Christian, uh, God's way of chastisement. Uh, like if I were to correct my son and I were to do it through um, some sort of punishment. Uh, and that's, get this, chastisement is not punishment. God does, there's no, there's no, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He does not impute on us punishment. It is always correction, correction, correction. But if I were to, um, uh, whoop Lucas, if I were to spank him. He doesn't understand the purpose or the process. He, he doesn't, I, unless he's taught it, unless he is taught it. And many Christians, they don't understand what's happening when God whoops them, when God is spanking them, so to speak. A lot of Christians, we fail to see that uh, God's love and God's, um, uh, that God desires, um, I use this word, uh, consecration. Consecration is just a, a process of becoming holy. Uh, a blessed man of God, a blessed woman of God, a blessed family of God, a holy person. Um, uh, we, we fail to see God's love and that God desires consecration from us. Uh, you can find in Romans 12. Romans 12, but it also directs chastisement. Consecration directs our chastisement. So after I've, I pulled out, I think, three or four different Bibles to kind of get their reading and commentary, and I pulled out some commentaries that I have and looked up words and had more more books opened up on my desk this morning than I think I've had in quite some time uh, uh, researching this. Um, but it, it, it concentrate, consecration also directs our chastisement. Hebrews chapter 11, which we know as 
the faith chapter, the hall of faith, by, um, by Abel and by uh, Enoch and by Moses and by Abraham and by Sarah and by Rahab and by all these, by all these people, uh, by faith, by faith, by faith. But if you read that whole chapter, it reveals something. It reveals, uh, I like something called alliteration, alliteration. Um, it just, it, it helps me uh, in preparedness. It helps m- my mind. There's, it, it reveals cause, it reveals character, and it reveals consequence. It reveals a cause, it reveals a character, and it reveals a consequence of chastisement in the past. You see, you, you'll read about all the people in Hebrews chapter 11. They weren't all like super trooper Christians. They didn't all like uh, uh, shine in all the moments of hardship of their life. Not that at all. It's that they followed the Lord. There were times of chastisement, but they continued on. They continued on. A lot of Christians, they, they, and I'm hopping ahead of myself here, but, but they follow the Lord, and then let's say you're on the mountaintop for a season of your life, and then all of a sudden you're in a valley for quite some time, and you have a decision to make. Take and eat what's on the table or push away from the table and rebel from the one who cooked it. Uh, many people, they, they rebel against the Lord. They turn against the Lord. They can't take it anymore. And the fact of the matter is, is yes, you can. You just decided not to. Yes, you can. God, just like the, the promise of for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. When the Lord said he would not give us burdens that we could not bear. Well, you can't bear it because you're trying to do it by yourself. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. He said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, everything that the Christian life is and revolves and teaches and has to offer in its very essence, at its very core, is the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is all connected to Jesus, every single bit of it, even our chastisement. Um, uh, Hebrews 11.40 reveals a cause, a character, and a consequence of chastisement in the past, But Hebrews chapter 12, which we just read, uh, uh, which I believe is written, uh, many people don't know who Hebrews was written by. I believe it was Paul. Um, uh, And uh, there's a whole, that's a whole nother time for a whole nother um, uh, reason why. But uh, I believe Paul reveals a cause, a character, and a consequence of chastisement now in the present, the church age. The church age. Now, these verses that we just read, these first 17 verses, or, um, oh, 15 verses, and and I'll I'll reference 16 and 17. Now, the purpose of Christian holiness, the purpose of Christian consecration is always to produce growth. Produce growth. The preacher doesn't get up and say, separate, 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 so we can have like a, so we have the right kind of traditional stigma for our church. If the pastor is preaching the Bible and he's preaching separation and he's doing it biblically, it's it's to produce growth, to grow in Christ, to grow in Christ. So if there's separation from the world, come up out of them. Be ye separate from them. Have no part with them. Um, uh, Don't party like they party. Don't talk like they talk. Don't walk like they walk. Don't think like they think. Come up out of them. It, It calls for a difference. It calls for a difference. Um, There are separation issues that are exclusive to women. There are separation issues that are exclusive to men, but then there are separation issues that, that, that throw everybody in the same lump there. But the, in, the, the reason for consecration is for growth. God wants us to grow. We are commanded to grow. Grow. But how do we do? We grow in grace. We grow in grace. And it's designed to help, not hurt. If the preacher gets up and says, guys, cut your hair. He's not being mean to you. He's trying to help you. If the preacher says, ladies, stop wearing Daisy Dukes and showing your thighs and your curves to everybody, he's not trying to be mean to you and hate on you and, and body shame you. He's trying to help you become a concentrate, consecrated, holy Christian, beautiful woman in the sight of God. If he says, clean up your language, if he says, clean up your language, he's not being mean to you. He's not trying to tell you what to do. He's trying to tell you what God is trying to tell you what to do. Oh, the preacher is just some tyrant. Oh, if he's preaching the Bible, you might as well just point your finger at God and call God a tyrant. Now, the thing is, is let's just wrap our minds around this right now. God is God. God is holy. And God is 
the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sufficient, all, he's everywhere at the same time. He knows you, if you're his child, knows you, knows what's in your mind, knows what's in your heart, and you might as well just be flipping the bird to him and saying, hang you, God, I'm going to do what I want to do. God says, all right, I'm going to have to chastise you. I'm going to have to chastise you to get you right, not because I hate you, not because I don't love you, but because I do love you. A father, the Bible, the Bible teaches that the, the parent who does not punish the child is a parent who does not love the child. God made that so. Why would God hold you up to a standard that he himself doesn't hold himself to? God said, I love you, therefore I will chastise you. I will chastise you. I will correct you. I'll correct you. The Bible says in verse number one of chapter 12, a great cloud of witnesses. A great cloud of witnesses. Now we are taught to remember um, uh, these people as faithful heroes, my, my uh, grandparents um, uh, and the forefathers of Scripture. And some of these, uh, mo- I think every man on this wall has passed away. Um, on these walls here, they're all passed away. The men out in the hallway, all pinned on the hallway. All those great men and women and their families of the faith are a great cloud of witnesses. And we're told and exhorted or taught uh, that these to remember them as faithful heroes described in chapter 11 like we have here today with us. Um, these were examples, chapter 11 is, in consecration because they are experienced, experienced in chastisement. Now, I'm taking things out of my commentary here. That's why may, it may be a little hard to, to, to uh, process or chew on. Now, um, uh, let me try to get into some meat here. So we are exhorted to remember, but then we're also encouraged, encouraged through our chastisement. Now, I'm going to get into how Jesus plays a part with this. It's not easy to profit from correction. The older I got, anytime my dad got in my face, I bristled up. I clenched my jaw. When I was a little kid, I was in total fear. Dad's all the way up there, and I'm down here, and he's big, and I'm small, and he's strong, and I'm not, and he's smart, and I'm not, and he could, he could do whatever he wanted. Mom and dad are scary, but the older I got, the, the bigger I got, the more I became, eh, not so scary. Not so, not, I, ain't, I ain't that scared. I had a, you know, I had a bravado to, you know, a persona to, to keep up with. Uh, but it's never easy to take ch- chastisement. <laughs> it's never easy to be corrected. It's never easy for somebody to yank your chain and get you back in, um, uh, uh, back in line. But not only is it not easy to, to profit from chastisement, it's also not easy to lay aside every weight. Some weights are hard to lay down. Some weights feel like they're almost attached to us. He says in verses 2 through 4, laying aside every weight which so easily besets us and the sin that so easily besets us. So the, the, uh, uh, Paul is writing here and he's, he, he puts Christ out there. He says, Christ is the source of your encouragement. Christ is the source of your encouragement for chastisement. Now, you have to think, if Christ suffered on the cross for sinners, He suffered chastisement for sin that was undeserved for him. He took it upon himself. Then we are not exempt to suffer suffer for our sins. Now understand this. You will never suffer in hell. Never suffer. If you are believed on Christ, you're a born-again Christian, you are his. You'll never suffer in hell, but you will suffer the law of sowing and reaping. You will sow what you, or you will reap what you have sowed. If you have become a born again child of God, you know that you are His, you know that you belong to Him, but yet you sow this lifestyle of, of rebellion and wickedness and, 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 um, uh, worldliness, then you're gonna have a bad harvest. A bad harvest, and you're gonna turn around and blame it on God or be mad at God. Now, Christ is presented as not only an encouragement, but also, I like the word emancipation. It's a, it's a neat word. I like that word, emancipation. He's an emancipator. What that mean? He's a freedom maker. He made us free. He made us free. So not only is he an example, uh, uh, not only are our, our, our uh, great cloud of witnesses from Hebrews chapter 11, our example to run our race with patience through faith, through hardships, and through chastisement. But also we get Jesus Christ who is an encouragement for us. And I'll give you the reasons why. 
Because he's our emancipator, um, uh, the Bible says, as the author and finisher of our faith. There you go. There's another one for our Catholic friends there, is author and finisher. He's the one who started it. He's the one who finished it. There are no additives. The author and finisher of our faith. What did he do? He emancipated us or freed us from slavery to sin. I don't have to be a slave to sin, and neither do you. Nobody has to be a slave to sin. Now, as a freed slave, or you could call me a freed saint, amen, uh, uh, we are to run the race that is set before us. You've been set free. Now, I have... I hadn't set you free just to set you free for the sake of setting you free, only to have you die and go to hell. I've set you free to give you purpose. I've set you free to set you on a a, a path. And what I want you to do is I want you to walk slowly if you must, but never walk backward. I want you to keep going. I want you to crawl. I want you to roll. I want you to wiggle. I want you to run. I want you to sprint. But I don't want you to stand still, and I don't want you to walk backwards. He set us on a course of freedom through salvation, not to go out and live on the highway to hell, but to live with with the highway of heaven in mind. Not looking toward the crowd, not looking toward uh, 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 um, our family, not, lo- not looking toward what the world may think of us or um, uh, uh, what anybody may think, but looking toward ourselves and in ourselves saying, I know that no matter what comes my way, blessing or correction, it's because God loves me. I know God loves me no matter what it may be. Now, there are at least two reasons, two reasons um, why we should look to Christ. Number one, because he's our, our, our example. And number two, because he's our encouragement. So he's my example. What, what is it about Christ as my example? Christ is my example of one who ran his race. Christ ran his race. I've said to people before, you know, they say, oh, yeah, that was not very, you know, Christian, da, da, da. And I tell people, look, I ain't Jesus. I use, and I've used that as, and I haven't said it lately, uh, but I'm not Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's like, well, you should be. And not Jesus himself, but you have an inheritance with him, Jake. You have a home in heaven with him, Jake. You have, a, you have a crown of glory and a robe of righteousness with him, Jake. You're going to heaven with him one day, Jake. You've been saved by his blood, so why shouldn't you be like him as best you can? As best you can. People right now, they get out on a basketball court. They try to play like their idol. They get out on a football field. They try to play like their idol. They look up to guys, guys that motivated them to play the game, guys that inspired them and women that inspired you to get into a field or a career or or chase a dream. For the Christian, Jesus is our idol. Jesus is the pinnacle. Jesus is the one who we are supposed to emulate and try to copy. He is our example. And in this case, it's because he ran his race. How did he run his race? Well, think about it. He left the land of Supreme blessing, sinlessness. He left heaven and came to earth and he lived a life of suffering and he did it among sinful people. Jesus ran his race. So he's my example. He's also my example of how he received his reward. You see, Jesus ran his race. He finished his work. The author and finisher of our faith, he finished his work that he came to do. The Bible says, and is now set down. He ran his race. And what what happened? He sat down on the right hand of God, on the throne of God, and now occupies, Jesus now occupies a a place of power and preeminence. He ran his race. He And he received his reward. But I can draw encouragement for this. Jesus is my encouragement. Uh, uh, Paul's writing to these, these, these Hebrew saints, and what were they going through? Biblical context, biblical history, they were suffering saints. They were saints who were going through the, through hardships. They lived in the world. We talked about it yesterday, being in the world, but not of it. Man, what a, what a, what a task. Being in the world, but not of it. And these, these, these Hebrews, they were facing incredible persecution. And persecution, persecution from where? From sin. Everybody in this room, you're persecuted by sin. Every single one of you. You're persecuted by sin. You're also persecuted by sinners. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They're all persecutors of followers of Christ. You are being persecuted. Persecuted. So Paul's writing to him. 
And he says, Christ is your example and Christ is your encouragement. You're persecuted from sin as well as pressure from sin. So to, 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 to these Christians, he says, he proclaims to them, he preaches to them, Christ is your encouragement in your time of chastisement. And here's the thing, Christ did it and so can you. Christ did it and so can you. You say, but he's Christ. I, I can't touch the hem of his garment. Yeah, you can, by faith. Because the Bible says by fa- without faith, it is impossible to please him. Uh, Christ had endured great persecution from sinners. The sinners he came to save are the same sinners who persecuted. The same sinners he came to preach to are the same ones who denied him. Christ had endured uh, his punishment on Calvary for our sin. He is our example, and he is our encouragement. Now, chastisement. Chastisement. How does it deal with us? What, what, let's get into some, to some, apl- some, some um, uh, uh, applicable things here. Verse number 5. Verse number 5 says... Um, Uh, Where are we? And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto unto children. My son, despise not. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Chastisement does not embody the idea of punishment for sin. Get this. Chastisement is not punishment for sin. It is the idea of purging from sin. It's correction. It's correction. It's correction. Okay, Luke, you did something bad. I punish you. I punished you for your error against the family code, whatever it may be. Dad said, don't, and you did. Mom said, don't, and you did. There's a a punishment there. There's a punishment or a correction. What we do as parents is we hope that our punishment fixes the problem. Many times it doesn't. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You know, where, at what point do we become adults and we become adults toward God? Uh, you're a child toward God. I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're 10 or, or 90. You are a child toward God. You're his child. And God will always see you as his child. God doesn't look at you and go, wow, how mature they are for, you know, 45. He doesn't know. You're his child. And you as a 45-year-old or a 55 or a 35, you, you, you look at yourself and you go, man, I still do that stupid thing. What is wrong with me? And, I just, and you don't have mom or dad or somebody there to jerk you up anymore and say, don't do that and wag their finger and stand you in a corner, you know, and no dessert for you tonight. You know, we don't have anybody to do that anymore. It's God. It's God who sees us and doles out the chastisement. It's not purging us because of. It's not punishment because of sin. It's purging from sin. To make us like Christ, it's correction. It's, um, I guess you could say, curbing that purges from sin and produces spirituality. So God permits it because it is needed. Why is it needed? Well, we're told right here in this verse because we forget. We forget. We forget. Some, I got to walk into a room and, hey, why is that there and what's going on and what do they do? After a while, man, they pick up, they take care of it, they do what they're supposed to do and then three weeks later, they need to be reminded again. Why? Because they forget. They forget. Paul said to the, to the saints, he said, I've got to stir up your remembrance. I've got to stir it up. I've got to often remind you. Sometimes you go, why are we here in this, on prayer again? Why are we here on faith again? Why? Because three weeks ago I, ta- I preached on faith and you don't remember what, not one point from it. You've got to be reminded about it over and over and over and over and over again, just like God has to correct us over and over and over again because we forget. We forget. Saints forget. Um, the Bible says as, that as God's children, um, uh, we were not to be loved by the world, neither were we to love the world. Or live like the world, so God permits chastisement to wake us up to this fact. God allows chastisement to pop, smack us in the back of the head a little bit, grab us by the front of the shirt and say, hey, oh man, I didn't even realize what I was doing. I didn't even, oh man, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that I was doing that. Um, uh, 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 Chastisement is needed because number one, Christians forget, and because number two, because Christians faint. Because we faint, because we quit. Because we, we, we say, I'm not, we throw in the towel. We say, I don't want to anymore. God permits chastisement in the lives of his children, that's us, because we forget not to hurt us, but to help us. Please remember that in Jeremiah, God says he, he has um, good thoughts towards us. 
Thoughts of love, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of caring. God cares about us. There's not, God's not standing around the corner waiting for you to trip up so he can bash you over the head. That's, that's not him. So chastisement should not be, um, uh, should not produce fainting or quitting. That's not what chastisement is. That, oh, God's hand is against me. I'm going to quit. No, God's hand is against you. Not against you. God's hand is chastening you for you, not against you. It's to, it becomes discouragement for some. They give up rather than it promoting faith and promoting faithfulness and promoting good works. We go, oh, God's against me. God's not against you. What you're going through in life, the chastisement from God is correction because he loves you. He loves you. Now, chastisement is designed to promote faith. Chastisement is designed to promote faith. Faith in, uh, Luke, if I were to correct you, it's to promote and to get it into your thick skull that dad and mom have a way of doing things that make the household run right, that keep you safe, that keep you out of trouble, that stop trouble from coming into the house, and for you to just get it through your head. So I'm going to correct you and correct your brothers time and time and time and time and time again until you just get it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 12, 6 through 10, it reveals two major evidences that chastisement is designed to promote Christian faith. Here it is. It's designed to, provo- uh, to promote, or excuse me, to prove sonship. If you don't get spanked by God, the Bible says you're probably not his son. You're probably not his son. Um, and, and then secondly, it's designed to, prom- to produce submission. It's my mom and I, she, well, she probably still beat me on it. Uh, I don't know what she called it, an uncle or something, where she'd take her fingers and she'd put them in mine and she would just twit, uncle, 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 uncle. She'd bend my fingers, but why do you think my thumb looks the way it does? Uh, she, um, she, uh, <laughs> uh, she, oh, uncle, uncle, uncle. My mom could beat me at it. Um, and uh, it's because she's shorter and had much more leverage. It's those, yeah, I'm telling you. Uh, but uh, I'm telling you, if God wants you to submit, he's gonna keep you under, your, under his thumb until you submit. God is going to get you to submit. God wants your heart. God's not going, submit, say uncle, say uncle, say uncle, and then beat you and go, ah, see, I knew you would. No, he's saying submit because I have all these good things for you. Submit to my will. I have all this stuff for you. I have the blessings for you and love for you to feel and, and uh, uh, the windows of heaven for, uh, to open up for you and to pour you out blessings. And I've got a good life for you. Submit to me, submit to me. God wants to produce submission. And that's what, that's what um, chastisement is for. Chastisement is designed to produce fruit. Fruit. Christians are to produce fruit, a fruit of righteousness. Fruits of righteousness, good works. God wants his children, his child's character to be righteous. And it should be. We're God's children. We're the people of heaven. We should have good, righteous character. Uh, chastisement is not always pleasant, but it's purifying. It purifies us. Lucas, um, uh, broke. I, I was um, waiting to, got home from soul winning yesterday, and I didn't feel so well, uh, so I ate a bunch of um, quesadillas and tacos from El Cabana down the street. I love that place. Uh, they have something called a, um, how's it pronounced, a waracha? Well, it's like, oh, come on now. I know where I'm going after church. Uh, Liberia El Cabana down here on New Haven in Lombard. Tell them I sent you. Um, but um, uh, uh, so I got some food and I, I took a little bit of a nap. I wasn't feeling well and I woke up and I'm like, you know, I don't, the best way to, uh, I'm going to go back and try to do what I used to do is just sweat it out. So I went upstairs and, and um, uh, took some pre-workout, you know, some caffeine and uh, started pumping iron. I'm like, all right, I feel better. And I'm like, all right, who wants to work out with me? And all my, you know, all four of the boys were like, oh, I do, I do. Uh, and they, so I showed them some exercises and showed them things to do. I go out of the room for five minutes and Lucas breaks two of his fingers, drops a dumbbell on his two fingers. I'm like, you st- dumbbell, uh, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> breaks two of his fingers. Oh no. So what do you do? You take it and you put them in ice. You got to bring that swelling down. And he says, it was cold. It's, it's ice. Yes, it's cold. A new revelation. Ice is cold. I said, put, put your fingers in ice and keep it. He said, but it hurts. It hurts. I said, yes, it hurts, but it, it helps. It hurts, but it helps. And sometimes God is doing things to us that hurt, but it helps. 
that's helping. You may not know it. You may not know the, the medical science behind it, but that, that cold brings the swelling down. Heat relaxes it. Cold makes it, uh, uh, cold um, uh, uh, takes that pain away. If you can, I mean, it hurts for a few minutes, but after a while it goes away and it brings down the pain. It brings it down. I'm like, oh, we got, I'm not taking you to the hospital. They're not going to do anything. They're gonna charge or gonna charge us two grand to put a stinking splint on your fingers. So brother Dan and I found, um, you know, one of those generic little wrenches that come with like cheap furniture. It's like so we got a little wrench and we we put it right here and then it splits off to both fingers and I got some tape, taped his fingers up. There you go. Keep it there until it's better. <laughs> Don't know what to tell you. Now if we could just do something about your face, we'll be all right. <laughs> I love you, son. Sit down. Be quiet. You hush. 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 Um, I'm here to help you. Um, I know it hurts, but it's here to help. Uh, so this, this chastisement from God, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts, but it's always to help. Always to help. He talks about the fire, putting the Christian in the fire. Why? To purify us, to burn away the dross, to burn away the things that, that, um, uh, uh, make, that mar us, that make us look ugly. I've had pennies before that you find and they got some gunk on them you can get a lighter you can get alcohol you um some gym beam no you get rubbing alcohol you get uh peroxide or whatever and you clean it up and you you put it under a flame and then you can polish that thing up what did it do now the penny has no feeling but that penny came out clean that penny came out purified that penny came out shiny and god says what i'm doing to you when i put you through tribulation when i put you through chastisement when i put you through correction it's because i'm cleaning you up i'm polishing you up i'm making you a better uh, advertisement i'm making you a better billboard um, and and in doing so you'll reap more blessings there'll be more treasures in heaven and more glory to give to god he says it may not be comfortable but I, it's, to, it's productive. It's profitable. God wants his children's conduct to be righteous. He wants us to do right. He wants us to be right. He wants us to, to, to think right. It's designed to, present, uh, to uh, produce repentance. Chastisement works in us for so many facets. And one of them is repentance. When God has got you in, in the submission move, repent. Repent. Uh, back when uh, uh, my brother Ben and I would go up to this MMA gym. There was this guy up there, he was huge, his name was Justin. He was like 6'6", 320 pounds. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll rest, I'll go with him, you know, I, because it's, it's just practice. We're just, it's just practice, you know. Um, I didn't know if he knew that or not. But um, uh, we're in practice, and, and he, what he do? He'd get you in an arm bar, or he'd get you in a choke hold, or he'd do something. I was like, look, do whatever you want, just don't break my bones like my mom does. Uh, but I said, um, you know, just don't, don't kill me, you know? And, and, and he'd get me in a submission move, and I'd be, I, what, would I, what do you do so you don't get knocked out and you don't get any bones broken? You tap out. You tap out. When are you going to get to the point where God has you in a lovingly choke hold? <laughs> He's got you in a in a um a, a, a loving arm bar, and he's like, just tap out, tap out, tap out, and you go, all right, I tap out, God, you have your way with me, and then you come into church and we sing, let him have his way with thee, his power is, and you're like, oh come on, oh man, I, I God, I love you, I thank you for saving me, but I really don't want to like give in anymore because you're going to ask for my money by it's not your money it's his all of it all 100 of it god you're going to ask me to go be a missionary uh, maybe maybe not and by the way once you give in to god and you've been following with god this isn't a by way when you've been following the lord long enough and he calls you to be a missionary you're totally okay with it he calls you to be a pastor you're totally okay with it he calls you to get involved in a ministry you'll not only be okay with it you'll want to You'll want to. God will change the desires of your heart when you repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Rebelling against the will of God, rebelling against the chastisement of God is unrighteousness. It's unrighteousness. 
um, chastisement. Man, we, we, it, it's got to lead us to repentance. Repentance, repentance, repentance. It's just a change of mind saying, dear God, I'm wrong and you're right. Dear God, uh, my ways are wrong and your ways are right. Lord, I've got a will of mine. My fleshly will is so strong. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you forgive me and would you help me and would you teach me and be patient with me and God will. The Bible uses long, God says the Bible is, um, the Bible says that God is long suffering toward them. He's long suffering. He's long suffering. And God will suffer with us in our suffering. Chastisement is designed to correct us. Correct us. Chastisement is designed to cause Christians to live in peace and to purify and look for peace of, to look for peace and purity. Now, chastisement, chastisement, chastisement. It has so many facets to it. There's so many things that go into it. But the Bible says for us not to despise the chastening of the Lord. So if the Lord, if you feel like the Lord is against you today, like, man, I, I just don't seem to be able to get this in the row. I just feel like God may be resisting me in some sort. And, and, and okay, good. Good. Because he's trying to get your attention. So what I would encourage you to do is to go to the Lord in prayer and say, dear God, direct my paths. Um, I had my own will. Um, I don't know how many years ago, a bunch of years ago. And I was in here on a Sunday morning, um, just kind of fixing the hymnals and stuff. And uh, my dad had already chastened me. I had some serious bitterness in my heart against a Christian, another Christian. Uh, I felt that they had done me wrong. They had lied to me. They had, they had led me in circles, you know, and, and I had some bitterness in my heart. And uh, I, was wrong. I was not right with God, but I stayed in church. So that's a key right there, staying in church. Um, and I was in here, and my dad came in, and he said, Jake, and he had, he had ripped me up and down in a, in, a, in a good way. I was taking out some trash, and he caught me on, I think it was a Wednesday night. It was Wednesday night. Uh, on a Wednesday night, and, and uh, come on, Jake, get a good eye, and just kind of ripped into me a little bit. All right, you know. Okay, I get it. I can take rebuke. And uh, I didn't go suck my thumb or, or be mad at him or hold a grudge. I, I, I got it. I knew what was wrong with me. But I just it didn't seem to be able to let go of it. And then so he walked in on that Sunday morning. And he said, hey, Jake, I, I ran across this verse, and I thought of you. Try to memorize it. And uh, it was Jeremiah 10, 23. It says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Because here I am, I'm trying to get my life to go down this way. And God was trying to get me to go another way. God was using that experience, that chastisement. God will use Christian brethren and Christian sistren, your sister, brothers and sisters in Christ. God will use any means possible to get you right with him. God will do whatever he has to do to get you right with him. And, um, I, I, you know, you hear the stories of really bad things happening to people so God could get their attention. I'm like, well, I don't want that to be me. I don't want something real bad to happen to me. I want to get right with God before. I don't want it to take that. God, I don't want you to have to put me in a hospital or take my eyes or, or take my hearing. And, and God, I don't want something bad to happen for you to get my attention. God, you have my attention. I, but I don't know how to get right. I don't know what to do. Isaiah 26, 3 says, that will keep, or yeah, 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not on thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not you. The, the responsibility of a child is to listen to mom and dad so mom and dad can direct the path of the child because mom and dad are letting God direct their path. When the child becomes an adult, the child says, okay, now I've got to start listening to God. Now I've got to be the one who follows after God. I don't want God to have to smack me down. I don't want God to have to put me in a hospital to get my attention. I'll tell you a story and, 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 and I'll, uh, we'll close. Once upon a time, there was a family of a backslidden church uh, of backslidden uh, uh, church members. They consisted of um, of uh, a father and three sons. They had all once been very active in church, but lately they had fallen away completely. 
um, pulled out of their ministries, pulled out of church, pulled out of the choir, pulled out of anything and everything. Um, uh, many people visited them. Uh, they asked them to come back, friends from church, uh, pastors and deacons and Sunday school teachers and um, uh, friends at church. They, 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 they visited them and said, why don't you all come back? Now, unfortunately, however, all the visiting, all the counseling, all the encouraging, and all the rebuking produced no effect upon either the father or any of the three sons. One day, when the sons were working in the field, a big rattlesnake raised up and bit the middle son. The boy became very, very sick, and uh, of course the doctor was called, and the doctor did what he could, but the prognosis was not good. He said, all we can do now is pray for this young man. Uh, the word sent the father into enough of a panic to call the pastor. The pastor immediately went out into the home um, uh, and was inf- uh, went out to the home and was informed of the uh, terrible, um, bleak-looking situation. The father said, "Please, pastor, please, we need you to pray." And the pastor said, "Very well." And then he started to pray. He began to pray and he said, "O oh, wise and all-knowing Father, we thank thee, for thou hast sent this rattlesnake to bite this young man in order to bring him to his senses. He has not been inside the church house for a long time." And it's doubtful that he is, uh, uh, in all that time, felt the need for prayer. Now we trust that this will prove a valuable lesson to him and that will lead to a genuine repentance. As the father and the other sons listened to the pastor's prayer, they were very surprised by his bluntness. Uh, What they didn't know was the pastor was about to get even more blunt. He continued praying and saying, Now, Father, wilt thou send another snake to bite the older brother? another snake to bite the younger brother and a big one to bite the father. For we, (laughs) yeah, for we have all been doing this, uh, for we have all been doing everything we know for some time now to restore them to the fellowship of the church. Uh, But it's been all to no avail. It seems therefore that all of our combined efforts could not do what this snake has done. We thus conclude that the only thing left to do to this family and for this family as any good is rattlesnakes. So, Lord, send us bigger and better rattlesnakes. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Whoa! <laughs> Come on now. So, people often, people often ask why. Why does God allow people to suffer? Why does God allow that to suffer? Well, sometimes he does it as a form of chastisement. I have, there are people who I just want to go to and look them in their eye and go, Come on, man! Do you not get it? I had somebody come to my house a few years ago um, on a Sunday afternoon and um, basically just try to get their bearings and go, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I say, don't you remember a youth conference so many years ago that this decision, da, da, da? Yeah. Okay, what else do I need to say? Like, you went to youth conference. You heard the same preaching I did. You're the one that walked the aisle and said, I surrender. Oh, we, so many preacher boys have passed through here, so many preacher boys all across the country, and they're, they're, their life is in turmoil, wondering what's going on. They're running from the call of God. You cannot run from the call of God and expect him not to chase you down. Expect him not to put, him, put you under his thumb and go, come on, tap out already. Tap out. Tap out. I love my brother Ben. My, my brother Ben's a dummy. You say, what are you talking about? Ben would get in the ring with some guys and Ben would, he would not tap out. You have to knock me out. If you're going to choke me out, you're going to choke me out. But I will pass out before I tap out. Like Ben, you know, they say if you do that, you lose brain cells. Now we know what's wrong with him. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, Ben, if you see this, I love you. Come get some. Uh, no, no. But people often ask, why? Why does God allow people to suffer? Because it could be a form of chastisement. Uh, the book of Psalms in, in chapter 119, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. He said, I went astray, and then I was afflicted. So many people are wondering, oh, my mental health. Oh, my physical health. I just don't seem to be able to get my finances right. I just don't seem to be able to get my relationships right. I just don't seem to be able to get these things in my life right. Something's missing. Something's not right. I don't know what's going on. Okay, well, let me ask you. Are you saved? Yeah, I know that I'm saved. I remember on whatever, January 29th of 2023, I got saved and and I asked the Lord to save me. Okay, well, then did you follow him as Lord? Did you start committing thy ways unto the Lord? Did you start committing your works unto the Lord? 
Did you start living for the Lord? Sure, I'll take you as Savior, but I don't want you as Lord. I want you to save me from hell, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. You can't, they, that will not work. The Bible says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? You can't walk with the Lord and um, uh, 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 you can't walk with the Lord and live for the devil. You can't do it. He said it before I went astray. But I w- before I was afflicted, I went astray. Oh, but now, I'm, now that I've learned your lesson, now that I've learned your lesson, I'm going to keep your word. The Bible says, without chastisement, we are not, we are not the children of God. So no loving, no right thinking parent enjoys discipline his his kid. I don't like doing it. Uh, Jamie's always like, you're the nice parent. I'm like, because I'm never home. You know, I'm on the road all the time. I get to come home. The last thing I want to do is be the big, be the big mean grizzly bear. Um, You know, and I like to have fun. So (laughs) let her be the. Wicked Witch of the North or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but um, I, I don't like doing it. I don't like snatching them up. I had to ah, get with Hudson yesterday about interrupting. I hate that. He, Hudson's my little buddy. He's four years old. How is he? Five years old? Five years old. And he gets this sad face and these big old alligator tears come welling up in his eyes. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry for yelling at you, buddy. <laughs> I don't like yelling at my kids. I don't want to do that. And God doesn't want to but he does it because he loves us. He does it because he has to correct us. So if you are in the correction of the Lord today, you don't have to shy away from God. You don't have to avoid God. Thank him today for chastisement. Now, I I have so much more and I'm done. Maybe you're not in chastisement, but you have a family member who is. You have a a loved one who is. A spouse, a a mother, a father, um, grandparents, um, uh, siblings. Uh, children, grandchildren, whatever the case may be, somebody who is living uh, outside of the will of God and they have hardships in their life that are unnecessary and it's just going to prolong itself because of the, the resistance against chastisement. Chastisement should lead to repentance, which should lead to faith, which should lead to fruits. Which should lead, and we all want those for our family members. I want that for me. I have, I'm the pastor of a church, and I still have to be corrected. Jamie does it all the time. I still have to be, I still, I still have to be corrected. I still have to get right. I still, oh Lord, I'm so sorry about that. But I'm telling you right now, it's so easy to, it's so much easier to go up to the Lord and go, Lord, I, I did not mean, I'm so sorry, Lord, would you forgive me? Instead of God going, come here, come here now. Uh, I was in church some time ago, and there is a, a parent who told their child, come here, come here. And that child looked at the parent and said, no. We look at that and go, oh, no, that's not good. Not only will my parents would do this or my mom, no, no, no. We all know, no matter what, how you deal with it or not, we all know that's not good. That's not a good thing. Do we do that to God? When God says, tithe, no. Hey, give that person a gospel track, no. Hey, go to church today, no. Hey, call so-and-so who you've been holding a, a, a grudge against for a while and just touch base, no. No, God. But we want to come sit down at the table and eat of all the blessings that he has? We can't do that rightly. Hey, God says, I do this. No, God has to chastise us. If I was the parent, I'd be like, I'm going to snatch that kid. I want, I'm not that kid's parent. I want to snatch him up. Actually, I want to snatch up the parent. <laughs> get your kid before I get him. That's, and I just dawned on me, man, do I do that to God? Does God have to chastise me and correct me? I don't want him to, but I know that when he does, it's because he loves me. If that's not you today, but you know somebody who is? Why don't you come up here and pray for them today? Ask for God to open up their heart, open up their mind. Would you bow your head and close your eyes, please? I'm going to ask Miss Jennifer to come, of course. And in just a moment, she's going to be prepared to, to start the, off, or the uh, offertory here and, and um, the invitation. And I'd ask that you'd come up here and, and, and pray for your uh, wayward loved one, a wayward friend. You know, I, I don't know that I could ever pray for bigger, better rattlesnakes on people. 
I don't know, but Lord, I will in your in your in your wrath remember mercy. Oh God, would you in your wrath remember mercy? Lord, if you have to snatch people up, help them to know it's because you love them. Oh God, would you enlighten them? Would you open up their heart and mind to let them know it's because you love them and you want what's best for them? And then when it comes to us, it's the same thing. You don't hate us. You're not mad at us. You just want to clean us up and correct us. Lord, thank you for your correction on us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? Miss Jennifer will begin to play. Would you come up here and pray? Hey, God, I've resisted your chastisement. God, I have, I have been angry at you. God, I have not accepted it. God, I've ran from it. I've resisted it. I've rebelled against it. Lord God, I repent today. Lord God, I ask for forgiveness today. Oh God, I want to yield to you. I want to do what's right. God, it's near them. Of a broken spirit and a contrite heart, God does not despise. Let's choose to live for the Lord today. Live for him and live with him. despise the chastening of the Lord. All right, you can remain standing. Have Brother Kevin come and sing us out of here. And uh, back tonight at 5 o'clock. Um, Pablo slipped in late. I'm going to point you out. Pablo's in town for work. He's from Illinois. He's uh, in, just in town working, swung by. Found us on Google, I suppose. So, uh, But uh, we're glad to have Pablo with us this morning. And um, I want you all to have a safe afternoon. Good afternoon. Be back tonight at 5 o'clock. Brother Kevin. Let's sing. We'll never say goodbye in glory.